And welcome to another Bangers and Classics podcast uh, with me, James Ruppert, and uh, him, David Malloy. And uh, David, what have you been up to? Hi, James. Um, well, I'm going to start off by not telling you what I've been up to, but by uh, going back over old ground. Last week, I talked about some red barns in Norfolk. And what I said was based on what I'd read well, many, many years ago. And it turns out not to have been quite right. There is an alternative and more popular account about those red barns. It is said that in 1940, um, RAF bomber pilots noticed that there were piles of agricultural lime spread out in the ground uh, in a line with our heads pointing towards meadows next to red barns. And this was investigated. MI5 got involved and there were arrests made. Now, whether that's the truth or not, it's hard to say. Details were a bit sketchy, but it's suggested that the barns were owned by people who'd moved to the UK and had links with Germany and had done things like removed hedges to make the fields larger so that the Germans could land gliders there in the event of an invasion. Whether it was true or not, I don't know, but it's an interesting story nonetheless. So anyway, I digress. Um, apart from that, I've just been uh, catching up on a few things. Um Hopefully getting the book finished this week with a bit of a delay. Uh, we're checking out different covers for it, different cover types. I've got that sorted out. So I've got one more run through it just to um, correct a few little foibles. And next week it should be out. How about you, James? What have you been up to? Well, strangely enough, David, I was very pleased with myself uh, a few weeks ago because uh, I took the spare wheel off the front of the uh, lorry, better known as a Series 3 uh, Land Rover, because it made it easier to open the bonnet because um, as I'm getting old and frail now, opening the bonnet <laughs> is uh, something <laughs> something of a workout. And I took it off and I couldn't believe it. It's, and it's like as light as a feather. Obviously, it's made from uh, aluminium, so, uh, you know, there's nothing to it really. Um, but, yeah, I, you know, I, I, I wrestled it off and I put it in the back. But then, obviously, um, I had to put a load of things in the back of the Land Rover. It was basically a bathroom in the back of the Land Rover. So I, I had to... Um, heft out the uh, wheel and um, so I've had a very premature workout and then get it back on the bonnet and then bolt it on because I thought I could leave it but obviously uh, the gods would mean that I would get a slow puncture or breakdown or something so I thought I'd better I better keep a spare wheel with me Um, and uh, when it comes to spare wheels that's the biggest spare wheel in the world I think pretty much apart from a JCB so uh, yeah so I've been um, I've been keeping myself fit and uh, healthy by throwing wheels around Right. Um, oh, yeah, I mean, you've been looking into barns, but... Uh, yeah, so I didn't find anything interesting. That's a shame. No no classic cars, I'm afraid, no. no. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, again, my luck was out, but th- there we go. But yeah, no, I, d- I haven't been chucking around wheels lately. Um, usually dodging wheels, other people chuck at me. <laughs> That's probably more accurate. This week's uh, banger or classic is a car that uh, was once a very common sight in British roads, and even more common sight in French roads, but it's a common sight nowhere now. It's the Chrysler Alpine, or if you prefer, the Simca 1307-8. Uh, what are your thoughts on it? Uh, it was a Talbot as well, wasn't it, David? It became it was, a Talbot, yeah. yeah. Yeah, it was a Talbot Solaro, wasn't it? And Talbot Alpine. Uh, Solaro was the booted one. Yeah, uh, that's It came right. along later. Mm, um, yeah. I think it, the Alpine became, it, it attracted other names such as Mink, uh, Minx and Rapier yes, it uh, did, as yeah. well. And in Spain, uh, Italy was called a tall, but 1510 or something. Yeah. Um, it had various names, but everybody knows it's the Alpine, so we'll just stick to that and we'll, right. we'll leave the Solara out of it because, you know, it's got a boot and therefore it's boring. <laughs> um, Not yeah. really, I just had to say that. <laughs> um, I, I do remember it very clearly at the time because I was, uh, you know, driving at the time it came out, folks. So that's that's how far I go back. Um and it was, I mean, I think I've been quite harsh um, uh, about it in the past, really, in that it was intended what it was meant to be. It didn't, didn't have a particularly good uh, engine to power it. And, when you, and I suppose, well, actually, when you compare it to uh, a full Cortina, which is what it was up against, actually, it should have wiped the floor, shouldn't it, with um, mm. uh, a full Cortina? But it, it sort of didn't. And they became bangers incredibly quickly. Um, you know, it really was within you know, a couple of years of them going off the boil and not being made anymore, which was very early 80s, wasn't it, 82 or something, uh, or maybe they went up to 84. But, um, yeah, I, I mean, they, you know, the, the values of them fell through the floor. Um, the rust meant that you fell through the floor as well. And it became a very ordinary, forgettable car, which in a way is actually quite sad, but um, the harshest crit- critics were actually car buyers. And, uh, 
maybe maybe they were correct at sort of seeing seeing through what they were presented with. Um, you might see it as a sort of a Renault 16 for uh, uh, you know the masses, but I don't know. Not a Renault 16, no. I mean, there are some good things about the Alpine. I mean, first of all, front wheel drive, which obviously uh, was the way things were going at the time. So up to spec there, independent suspension, good rack and pinion steering, all good transverse engines, which are powerful uh, for the you know in terms of the capacity anyway. By the standards of the day, all good. Rode very well and well, it's handled tidily enough. Um, nice enough looking the inside, and I should know I actually failed my driving test on one, but I'm not going <laughs> to go into that. Um, weaknesses, though, and it did have some. Uh, one was common to just about everything built in the 70s, whether it was, whether it was made of metal or not, it rusted mm. uh, quite badly, and that was it. The other thing was the engines, as you've identified. Mm. These engines were from the 60s, and yeah. they were overhead valve engines, as I say, reasonably powerful for the day, but they were quite harsh and they rattled like crazy after a little while. Um, they needed better engines. The funding just wasn't there no. uh, for those engines. And that was a big problem was a lack of development. It got a new front end and a Talbot badge, and that was about it. And, of course, the booted version of Solara came along. But at one stage, they were building over a 1,000 of these a day in France. Uh, it really was very, very popular. But unfortunately... Uh, Again, the lack of development, as with so many cars that start off well, they make us somehow contrive to lose money. And in this case, it was Chrysler Europe. It was really the UK arm that was losing money hand over fist. I think Simca were doing quite well Hmm. at the time. The French side of it, the British side of it, unfortunately, wasn't doing so well. And basically, um, profits made in one sector were trying to offset losses in another. It wasn't working. The big problem, of course, was Chrysler Europe's inability to harmonise the efforts of its UK production arm and its French production arm. Because if they put them together, they were good engineers and good designers in both. They could have had something that was very viable, but they completely failed. Anyway, some salient facts about the Alpine. It was styled by Roy Axe. It was styled in the United Kingdom, not in France. And here's a question, James. Do you think Roy Axe was known as Chopper to his pals? <laughs> Most likely, I understand he was a very nice chap. Um, and, well, there uh, we go. And uh, yeah, just thinking I, maybe. He can... <laughs> and he did. Just thinking and maybe he, he played. Sorry, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> I was just thinking maybe he played centre half for the sort of Chrysler you know, UK Works team or something. You know, he could have done, couldn't he? That's it. Also, the Alpine won the European Car of the Year Award, nineteen seventy six. Sold very well in France for a while, but in Britain, it was never better than eleventh in the charts. That was nineteen seventy six. Mm. Also, Neil Armstrong owned one. There's a joke. There's a joke coming, surely. No, Neil, Neil Armstrong yeah. owned a, a Chrysler Alpine. Yeah, it was a guy that lived across the road from us yeah, back in the a, 70s. Good old Neil. Yeah. Yeah, good old Neil. I mean, he, he might not be an astronaut, but he was certainly a space cadet, that's yeah. for sure. Um, and the final fact is, in the UK, between the Talbot and the Chrysler models, there are 26 left on the road, as at the end of last year, according to the DVLA figures. It's not a lot. Uh, for my money, in spite of its rubbish engines, and probably I think it had quite weak in commission of gears as well, I'm going to call it a classic because it looked pretty good. It had all the ingredients except the engines to make a success, and well, and proper rust proofing, but that was common to everybody. It should have been a bigger success than it was, and it's a case of a victory um, lost in, in my view, but still I'm going to call it a classic. What do you say, Cla- classic or banger? I think because of the mere fact you said there's only 26 left and it seems to have spent most of its entire life as sort of almost almost the quintessential banger, um, it sort of deserves to be a classic, really, doesn't it? Right. So we're calling it a banger then. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> it's a banger classic. No, it's a classic. It's a classic. I'd be excommunicated from the former Chrysler Owner Club. Not that I was ever a member, but they'd probably be after me if I said otherwise. Yeah. So there we go. Um, actually, not a, I'll be honest, not a bad car to drive. A nice, comfortable car that just could have been screwed together a bit better. But how many cars can we say that about? Anyway, we set ourselves a challenge this week, didn't we, James? Well, you did, uh, David. You gave me some <laughs> homework uh, to do. I mean, I just, I just want a quiet life. I just want to agree with you, disagree with you, and then, and then go home at the end of the day. But you make me do work. <laughs> the challenge is we would each look for a car on the interweb. Could be any car you like. The only proviso was it couldn't cost more than a monkey. 
And what were those cars we came up with? Well, we'll find out after a very short break. You're listening to Bangers and Classics, the 39th most popular podcast on the island of Rock Hall. So we're back and it's time to find out what cars we've each come up with. James, do you want to kick this one off? Yeah, I'm quite uh, happy to do that. I I went through a lot of cheap car ads and uh, most most of the pleasure is, is sort of reading the uh, description or lack of description. Um, and also how triggered the the sellers are because uh, they've obviously been through this before that people are you know have only got a few hundred quid and uh, they're going to turn up and they're going to criticise their car uh, so they in a way they want to get all of their um, digs in early so you can't say I never told you so so I I did find I did find a vehicle with a very long description and uh, a very long justification for selling it um, but. The, one of the main reasons was it's uh, a Ford Mondeo, which I which I quite like the the Mondeo Mark II. It's a two thousand and two example, and I think that's probably the best version uh, of all the Mondeos. Um, and to add insult to injury, it's a it was a, a two liter diesel, so that's terribly unfashionable. Um, but um, it's done 170,000 miles and uh, it's, yeah, it, it was up and it's a gear. Uh, I must point, point that out. Ooh. It's a, a gear version. So it's a, it's very, very posh. Um, and yeah, 499 pounds. So I've actually saved myself a pound there. I don't know what I'm going to do with that pound. Um, but, uh, you, you know, the description was fa- fa- fairly amusing and uh, mostly because the seller signs off with no no test pilots where you just think, who who on earth is going to test pilot a, you know, a, a 2002 Mondeo, a 19-year-old car? But Not Neil Armstrong. Uh, yeah, not, not, certainly not. Um, uh, <laughs> but, um, uh, yeah, I, I just thought, yeah, it's a very good car. And um, uh, I'd probably buy that because it, it would do it would do a job. It would get me shopping, and there'd be loads of room, and you, you could get everybody on board. It's got a nice big boot. It's quite nice to drive. Hopefully, um, even though it is nineteen years old, and uh, uh, I'd take a chance on it. So, right. um, what did you pick then, David? Well, I'll come back to that in a minute. I mean, I'm a bit yeah. concerned about your choice, James, because really, was that? Well, I thought you'd have gone for something a bit more stylish, and just in case you met the MFU uh, lookalike or MFU wannabe woman. Yeah, now, I'm not. I'm not sure she would go for a guy in a Monday or somehow. Uh, which, which you walk away from MGB GT, her pristine MGB GT, for a guy in a a, a, a pretty, pretty well used, shall we say, uh, Monday. I just don't know. Hmm. Oh well. Anyway, what did I come up with? Well, my first thought was, what idiot came up with this idea? And then I looked in the mirror. Then I spent a morning wading through online ads uh, for cars that even Arthur Daly would have shied away from selling. There were wrecks, there were junkers, and there were pale battalions, or should it be beyond the pale battalions, of cars with knackered gearboxes. There was an MX-5 that looked like it had been used as a paddling pool at one stage, a Mercedes 220 CDI that was listed with an upside-down photo, so maybe it was an Australian spec car. That had nearly 300,000 miles on it, and the ad said, and I love this bit, it's ideal for rough use or spares. Now, what is rough use anyway? I mean, is it a situation where someone's driving around a car and a sort of unruly matter and a clean cut chap comes along and says, I, I, I say, you, you unhand that car, you ruffian, you know? I just don't know. Anyway, picking a car out from this connoisseur selection of absolute heaps was no easy task. But then it struck me any car at this price is going to break down. So I thought, may as well be comfortable while waiting for the breakdown truck. And this led me to, and you ain't going to believe this, a Mondeo 2-litre diesel. This one, however, is a 2007 Quite car. What? Goodness me. <laughs> I know. I mean, we, should, we should plan these things a bit better. I, I presume this is, this is proof <laughs> that we don't, isn't it, then? We don't. Okay. This is, this okay. Yeah, I'm sorry, David. The most totally I'll, unscripted I'll show in the world. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Uh, so it's got, it's got an MOT until November. It's a 2007 model. There's a bit of, it's a category D as well, I should say. There's a bit of rust on one of the wheel arches. Um, front and rear bumper has got some slight damage to it. Apparently it drives okay. 107,000 miles. MOT history actually is pretty good. There's nothing in there that would make you run screaming. It's really quite good. And it's US worth um, £500. 
And in terms of spec, I didn't write down all the model details. It's one of these models with about 15 letters after them. Mm. All I can tell you is it's a 2-liter TDCI saloon in black. And I thought, you know what? That's actually not too bad for the money. So there we go. We're both gone for the Mondeo. What does that say about us? Nothing good, I suspect. So we managed to completely cock up our one assignment this week by both going for almost the same car, which, as you say, James, proves this is completely and utterly unscripted. Uh, in fact, quite frankly, I don't think either of us has got an idea of where we're going to go with it next, which is fun. So where are we going to go with this next, James? Uh, I think we were hoping to talk about cars that we regret not buying. I'm actually quite happy um, with um, the cars that I've uh, avoided uh, and and bought and not bought. I'm I'm actually I'm actually okay about it. I can sleep at night um, without you know worrying that um, I've missed out on some amazing bargain. But I did a few years ago. I, I went to a dinner party uh, with people who 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 used to be friends, and um, I I've never drunk so much in my life, David. It was um, it, it was. It, it was that point where you drunk so much, you 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 get back to where you were before. So it was so it, it's sort of completely pointless drinking so much, because uh, you've 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 drunk yourself back to um, sobriety again, effectively. Um, but this was uh, in the summer, so uh, by the time we we stumbled out of where we'd been, which wasn't very far away actually, it was a it was a nice um, country house, um, and and had drunk the um, uh, wine cellar, and there was a wine cellar as well. That's that's how posh these people were. Oh. Uh, by the time we drunk it dry, but what they told me um, is that they had a Bristol, and they'd bought a Bristol because somebody who knew about cars apparently and said, Oh, what you want to do is you want to buy one of those and restore it. And I think they, uh, they asked someone, uh, you know, who had a garage and said, would you restore it? And they've sort of gone, well, no, or it would cost, you know, like a million T pounds to restore and it will still only be worth 12 grand or something. So, so I, I began the long process of saying, will you sell it to me? And, uh, that lasted all night. Um, and then the next day, obviously, I rang them up and said, "Well, yeah, you know, you said it's in a, a garage, not 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 far away." And ob- obviously, I'm not the right type. I think that's basically what it what it is. I think I was a bit too scum for them, and they they would not sell me. My money was not good enough uh, for them because I said, "Well, you know, I'll take it off your hands." Because they they said they didn't know what to do with it because obviously they were they were a bit clueless about putting it back together again, but was so frightened by the restoration costs because uh, I think doing anything on a Bristol because it's hand built is just, you know, stupid really. Uh, but my local garage actually does have one that goes in for a service now and then I thought, well, they'll, they'll know whether it's uh, any good or not. Um, so yeah, so yeah, I tried my best, but uh, it was a it was a class issue, David, really, <laughs> is that uh, I hadn't gone to the right schools. I hadn't had the right jobs. Um, and they didn't like the cut of my jib. And, um, yeah, we don't have anything to do with them anymore. So, basically, it was a very unsuccessful evening. Uh, but but these were your friends? Well, yeah, they sort of, yeah, in a way, they're like friends of friends. And it was, yeah, it was all very posh. There was only um, eight, eight, eight of us there, you know, there was, uh, four couples and stuff. But, you know, um, but I can still remember it. I remember it extremely clearly because I, I just remember that, you know, when we left there, it was we were, when we went in. It was daylight, and it became night, and then it was daylight again when we when we left. So uh, I don't know. It was a good night, but um, uh, I didn't end up with a Bristol at the end of it. No. So what you about you, read, you? Well, I was just going to say if you if you bought a Bristol, you'd have to buy a second one and get them both restored. So James, yeah, uh, what car do I regret not buying? Well, there's been a few. There's been a few I regret buying as well. Let's be honest, quite a few of those. I suppose the one I regret not buying is a 205 GTI. Um, classic case with me, I went along to see it. It's a bit like my uncle, actually, a story I've told about him. Went to a garage. They had a nice 1.6 GTI. I didn't want a 1.9. I was quite happy with a 1.6. And unfortunately, it wasn't Miami blue. Um, I probably would have forced the issue if it had been. That was my favorite color. It was a nice red 1.6 GTI. In the garage in Glasgow, and I wandered around, had a good look at it. I thought, yeah, that's quite nice. It wasn't a new one; it was a used one, and yeah, it looked pretty good. Um, wandered around. Could I find a salesman? No, they were obviously all cluttered away, hiding from me. Either that, I thought we're not selling a car to this idiot. So I was there for about half an hour. Could find absolutely nobody that would talk to me about the car. 
Um, so I walked away. I went and bought something else instead, which I don't regret buying, but I do regret never actually having had uh, a 205 because great little cars, great fun to drive, and a little bit of a void in my motoring life, I suppose, where a 205 should have been. And that's really my only regret. So there's another one. There's a Honda CRX, um, the sort of phase two hatchback style. The one from, I think it was about 87, 88. Um, these came in. And I went to see one of those as well. And salesman tried to stiff me on the trade and tried to bump the price up, um, saying they wanted to trade my car in. But the advert didn't say anything about that. So I had a few choice words with him, mentioned a couple of things and um, from of, of a legal nature, shall we say, and wandered off and again, bought something else. That's also a regret, but it's nowhere near as big as the 205. Anyway, we'll take a break there. This is Bangers and Classics, the official sponsors of the British Ecky Thump team. We'd like to cover random topics and bangers and classics and then just go off at tangents. That's just the way of it. And here's one we've literally just thought of, the etiquette of waving at other drivers. Uh, and James, you're a man who's got a Land Rover. Is there any particular etiquette you've noticed uh, when it comes to acknowledging the presence or existence of other drivers of Land Rovers? Well, it does it does depend i mean you 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 can get some very enthusiastic people who um uh, will you know wave back at you like a loony um what you're i think what you're supposed to do is your your hand that that is on the steering wheel um the two of the fingers you can raise and that is that is the nicest way to do it i think that's sort of saying yeah i'm in the same club as you look at that oh, aren't we clever by both owning Land Rovers, and I must. This isn't just any Land Rovers because you, you know, if someone's or if someone's in in a Range Rover, you don't wave at them, or someone's in a um, uh, uh, in a Freelander, you know, you know, you don't wave at them, um, or or a Discovery, or, um, or or what's that other thing called a Velar, which I don't understand. I don't understand where that is in the Land Rover uh, uh, lineup at all. But yeah, it's also the Evoque as well, yeah. There, there is, isn't there? Yeah. So that's yeah. right. So, so, so there's a lot of Land Rovers about, but obviously this is very, very spe- specific. So we're going. It's basically Defenders, uh, and it's the series models. Um, and there are, I, I think, there is a, a sort of hardcore. Just believe it should just be series owners, because if you're if you're a series owner, then you're you're seriously um, serious about uh, your Land Rover. Whereas if you've got a Defender, especially a late Defender, you're you know you're a, a very late comer to the party. I mean, you've probably got a heater in there or something. You know, you're you know probably <laughs> you're, you're probably completely. Uh, you probably get intact scale. floorboards. Oh, intact floor pan. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, because I I've got a lot of a- admiration for a, 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 a bloke who's got a quite a ratty um, series two. Um, it does have a canvas hood. It does look really. It does look as though it's you know been there and back you know several times around the world and he wears like a, a floppy australian hat thing combo um and he may even have facial hair i think but he he resolutely does not acknowledge anybody so so even me with my slightly dirty looking series three you think well he, he might he might stretch it and 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 you know and raise those fingers from the from the steering wheel but no he doesn't he just he just continues on his journey uh to wherever but he's obviously a local bloke to me um, but right. yeah, he ju- he just gets on about it. But you know, he's got standards. But is he correct? And and in a way, that's a question we're all asking. And you can apply this to all classic cars. It, it, it is you know, are we are we a big family? Um, and maybe should we start? Should we extend this to bangers? You know, if if you're in a banger and, and someone else is clearly is clearly um, you know on their financial uppers like you and can only afford to uh, run uh, you know a uh, uh, you know. Uh, a Talbot or something, should you acknowledge them? I don't know. It's it's a very difficult and uh, pressing topic. Mm. Well, I'm just well, I'm just wondering if you're in your old Land Rover. I think yours is quite old, isn't it, James? Well, it's 1984. It's not as old old as it could right. be, and it's it's one of the last of the Series Threes. But right, well, it's 37. So, uh, if mm. you see someone coming past in a brand new Range Rover, do you think they expect you to tug the forelock? That's what I want to know. Most likely, they do. Yeah. Right. Uh, but but as we all know, old loan, old Land Rover is, is old money. You can go. I mean, this is the point. You can go anywhere ah. in a serious Land Rover, and you will get in. Whereas everybody else with a brand new Range Rover is nouveau riche, and they will be told to park somewhere else. Whereas we would, we would get instant access to a point to point or 
something you know right. some event like that or maybe a dinner party david you know you know right push, i've, I've never been to a dinner party in my well, life there you go well that's right you'd be allowed to park on the gravel drive whereas someone no, else they wouldn't, was, they wouldn't even let me park there mate they, I mean, wouldn't they really no they've probably got sentries posted at the village yeah. outside the village wherever they're, wherever they're holding this to prevent me from uh, coming or you know let down my tires or something to make sure uh, even if i did get the invite which of course they didn't send uh, i wouldn't be able to attend but i'm just wondering the the people, these nouveau riche people in their mm. uh, very expensive new Range Rovers, do they understand the social niceties, James, that obviously it's inverted snobbery, the older the Land Rover, the higher up the social scale you are? Or do you think that's probably, something they've not really appreciated? No, probably not. You know, some some I should think do, but on the whole, no. They've just got, they've just got yeah. a big fancy off-roader that will break down inevitably, right. as we know. See, this takes, me, this takes me back to your Bristol story. Mm. And you've got an old Land Rover, therefore you're extremely posh. Mm, oh, yeah. And these people wouldn't sell you a Bristol because you weren't posh enough. That begs the question, how posh were they? Well, they were f- obviously far posher than me. Um, but yeah. I, didn't t- I didn't turn up in the Land Rover. So maybe uh-huh. that was a, so maybe that was a that mistake. Was problem. Yeah. That's it. That's it. See, with Bangers and Classics has nailed it yet again. We've come to the bit of the problem. We've put our minds together and we've addressed the issue. Um, talking of old Land Rovers, there's a, a video channel uh, on YouTube run by a guy. It's, the channel's called Simon. It's, oh, so read it out to you. Simon, comma, a bloke in the woods. It's a guy who goes wild camping and various adventures. The relevance of that to cars is that he owns and loves an old Land Rover. It seems to be his only vehicle. He uses it for work, for leisure, and for going off in expeditions, and he's modified it. And it seems that he's owned a number of Land Rovers over the years. And he's done a couple of videos about the car, um, I would recommend this channel, even if you're not really interested in a Land Rover. It's very good, very peaceful viewing, very interesting. He's an engaging chap, but his pieces of the Land Rover are particularly interesting. So I would suggest you give those a shout. If you Again, just go to YouTube, type in Simon, a bloke in the woods, and you'll find out who's he, who he is. And he lives, I believe, James, not desperately far from here. He's, he's somewhere in Norfolkshire. Well, that's it. all the best people do live down here, David, and uh, mm. we're looking forward to welcoming you to, you know, to, uh, to the area if your application uh, goes well, you know. But, uh, so, that won't go yeah. well. No, no, no chance of that. Won't. No, no, I won't. No, I'll, 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 be, I'll be banned. I mean, um, <laughs> just trying to think of all the, all the places that won't have me. Uh, it's a long list. It's actually easier to list the ones that will, to be honest. Yeah. But anyway, this chap, Simon, funnily enough, he often wears a hat that looks kind of like an Australian hat as well. Mm. So yeah, again, maybe that's sure a thing. Sort of, yeah, well, that's right. It'd be very, very nice to meet Simon, and especially as he's not far away from me. So maybe we should meet up. Yeah, you, you should. I think that would be, that'd be quite good. Uh, you know, he could make some food in his Dutch oven. He's a bit of a dab hand at the cooking of Simon. So yeah, definitely, definitely want to check out a sort of uh, bangers and classics goes wild. That might be it interesting. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's it. Just got even more and more off track, you know, than we usually do. Anyway, and and that's somewhat my deal. I have nothing to nothing to add about Land Rover etiquette because they've never actually owned a Land Rover. We've owned a few four befores, and, and there's no particular etiquette there. But obviously, Land Rover Defenders, or you know, the ninety and the one ten before they were called Defender. Um, a special breed, I think, of car and probably a special breed of owner. And I've yet to meet someone who's owned a Land Rover who A, doesn't complain about it, but B, wouldn't ever be parted from them. And that, again, may be a subject of conversation. Another day, James, what do you think? Yeah, it can do, because I remember speaking to some uh, owners. Again, when I used to be a proper journalist and I did consumer articles, I spoke to people Mm -hmm. who owned uh, Discoveries, and uh, they would tell you all these terrible stories about how they basically died in their in their Land Rover when it broke down and stuff. And then you said, "Would you would you buy another one?" They go, "Oh yeah." <laughs> so you, hey, what? Yeah. You know, so yeah, they do love their Land Rovers for yeah. some reason. And it's, it's possibly even we can even extend that because is it the case that sometimes people who have really bad experiences with cars, not me and Rover Two One Threes, I hasten to add, um, somehow managed to put that behind them and put it to the side and form a deep-rooted attachment to those particular cars. There might be some sort of psychological issue there that, that you know you can put on your, your tweed jacket and your horn rim glasses, James, and explain to us. Of course, so, absolutely. Yeah, I'll, I'll have to do some research for that, unfortunately. Yes, absolutely. I mean, I, I think this is it. You could, be, you could become a new agony uncle. Send your motoring mm-hmm. problems to James, and mm-hmm. once, once he's finished laughing at him, he might help you. And on that, we'll call it a day. Thanks for listening to this week's podcast. And to quote the two boys, it's goodbye from him. 
and uh, I'm raising my hand from the steering wheel at you.